co-hosting this evening along with Steve who's up on the screen from Head to Foot Orthotics. He's down in Melbourne um, and we also have Flora who's presenting this evening all the way from Belgium. So thanks Hello. for bearing with us. We're sort of, it's a three-way host um, across three different areas. So I think we're doing pretty well so far. Um, so Advanced Rehab Centre, we're in Sydney, we're a neuro rehab provider of physio, OT and exercise physiology. Um, we have Steve here, so Steve's from Head to Foot Orthotics, um, so they will predominantly see patients with neurological and orthopaedic conditions um, and also work closely alongside physiotherapists. So Head to Foot Orthotics are the distributors of the multi-motion joint in Australia and New Zealand and manufacture the devices utilising these joints too. Um, Flora, so Flora, thank you for joining us from Belgium and getting up early for us. Um, Flora is a certified prosthetist orthotist as well as physiotherapist, so has lots of experience um, through neurological and orthopaedic rehab um, and has worked extensively with children for seating devices and now very much within contracture management. Um, and I'm sure, Flora, you'll be able to introduce yourself um, a lot better than I have just there <laughs> and give us a bit more background job. to your experience as well. So um, we'll hand the hosting over to you now, Flora. Okay. And hopefully. Let's see if we can do that. Are we here? Is this working? Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Not me, but the screen. Yeah, we can see the screen. Okay, perfect. I will just, because I have a lot of screens uh, in between, I'll just remove those so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Welcome. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all and say welcome to everybody who takes some time to follow our webinar and I'd like to thank uh, Advanced Rehab Center for having us and um, Steve uh, Joseph from Head to Foot Orthotic as well for um, organizing this and um, for having us from all over the world together on this webinar. So I'm um, from Basco and um, Melissa introduced myself. I'm a PT and a CPO. Um, I will not talk a lot about myself, but Basco is a company uh, situated in Holland uh, and we are distributing our products now in 26 countries and Head to Foot Orthotics is our distributor in Australia. So let's see what we can do here. Of course we're not going to talk about uh, Ludwig van Beethoven or uh, the Free Lise, but this little movie just um, is beautiful to see how different stretching and lengthening of muscles is and how individual uh, it can be. Um, just a beautiful reminder. It's, it reminds me of myself being a young child. I was not really stretchable. Um, I'm not at the moment as well. So today we're going to talk about contracture management um, with multi-motion uh, by head to foot orthotics, distributed by head to foot orthotics. So uh, we're talking about talk about contractures, um, its origin, the LLPS treatment, dynamic treatment. We're going to talk about some case studies and of course a little bit about the tone treatment because a lot of times we can see contractures in combination with tone. If there are questions during uh, this webinar, we will ask you to uh, put the um, questions on the chat box and afterwards we will get back to them and answer the questions. So, First thing to ask is, what is a contracture? We all know when we have it in our hands what it is, but it's good to remember um, uh, what it is in cells and so on, so we can know how to treat afterwards. So it's a conditioning of shortening and hardening of muscles, tendons, or other connective tissue, which leads to deformity and rigidity of joints. And of course, that will lead us to a limited range of motion. So we have here a few of our um, contractures seeing here, and um, we have a good news because if we do it the right way, it can be a reversible process. So what are the factors that leads to uh, a contracture? First of all, the most important thing, it's always, it always comes from a long-term immobilization. 
which will make our joint not functioning anymore. And so uh, we will have a limited range of motion. It can be due to oedema or heart drops. We can also have a delayed wound healing. We can um, have that by abnormal muscle tone regulation, which we have a lot of times. We can see that each day if we want. Um, then we can also have it due to fibrosis in injured soft tissue and uh, after fixation, um, trauma, surgery and so on. It can be by plaster or by an immobilizator. Um, and of course it can be, and a lot of times we see a lot of foot coming out of uh, patients coming out of a coma the bad positioning during coma. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but looking at um, the news last time, it was a lot about Corona. And if you see some pictures from the COVID-19 um, intensive care units, you could see a lot of time people laying there with uh, feet in equinus. Uh, we will talk about that later, uh, how bad this can be. And of course, those people are really cared about the person itself and its lungs uh, at this moment. Uh, but it's very important to also treat that in the early stage of immobilization. All those factors will lead for us to a real challenge, which we'll call the range of motions challenge, the wrong challenge. Um, we will uh, make sure that we get out of that um, range of motion limitation. So we're not histologists, me neither, um, but it's just important to have some um, views on what happens into the cells uh, to understand better how we can treat. So looking at the changes after an immobilization in the cells, we can see um, in the crosslinks that they will stick together. Normally, we have here our uh, connective tissue, which is well organized with a lubricant, which is called our glycosaminoglycans uh, in between. And um, if we are immob immobilized, those tissues will not be well organized anymore and they will turn on to just, yeah, um, disconnection and we will have adhesions in those crosslinks. When you look to another factor, um, which is um, our normal fibroblasts in our um, muscle tissue and in our connective tissue, we can see that having um, creation of myofibril that's due to a trauma or due to um, tension coming up, you will see uh, myofibroblasts coming in. Those myofibroblasts will try to stabilize, stabilize uh, the muscle and we will get a contraction in the connective tissue, which will lead us to rigidity. We'll come back to that afterwards. Also the adhesion of synovial villi in the uh, capsular joint, uh, we will see that there will, no be, uh, there will be adhesions and uh, we will have some rigidity in the joint as well. And we see a uh, disrupted ratio between the new and old collagen fibers. We will see an increased breakdown and unfortunately an elevated lower quality collagen coming up, which will have us uh, not really good connective tissue. But the most important thing is the next one is our uh, muscle itself, our skeletal muscle. Um, we have our um, sarcomere and in our sarcomere we'll have our actins and myosins and while we immobilize a muscle or a joint we'll see some um, big changes in those um, active myogenic sarcomeric structures. So if we look at our actins and myosins or sarcomere we can see here uh, in relaxed state that we have a good overlap of those actins and myosins and we need them because if we want to do a normal contraction into a normal healthy tissue we will see those actins and myosins overlapping and contracting but after um, if they stay into one another if we have a contracture an immobilization and a shortening of tissue we will see this happening those actins and myosins will stay in there and they will just get shorter and shorter even um, be removed so the chain of actins and myosins will make um, us a shorter chain of uh, uh, cells it's very good and important to know that the shortening plays a larger role 
in the loss of range of motion than the other joint structures we just talked about. So that's very important to know how we can treat and on what we have to focus on. So um, if we look at this picture, we can see here on A, we see those flexors in the arm and extensors in the arm in a normal length with a normal activation, normal range of motion. But if we start to immobilize that joint and we put the flexors on a shorter position, we will see that the overlap of actines and myosines will be increased, shortened, and that we will have, and this, excuse me, yep. Um, that we will have at the extensors a lengthening, so a minimal overlap of those actines and myosines. After a while, we will see later on uh, after how many times, we can see that those sarcomeres will be removed um, at the shorter side and will be added at the length, uh, the longer side, the uh, elongated side. But that gives us also a big difference in uh, range of motion um, and it's very beautiful to see how that happens and this is almost shocking because in three days after uh, having an immobilization we can see that the loss of muscle tissue in mass will be uh, can decrease up to 17 percent when we look at that decrease it will be bigger and bigger into uh, weeks um, after immobilization but in two weeks, we will go up to 20 degrees of loss of range of motion. And this is huge because after two weeks, we can see that the muscle is already adapted and will settle around the angle of immobilization, which means that due to the atrophy we had, um, we will have also some loss of force, which will make sure that we will not have that active range of motion anymore. So time is really essential for treating uh, those uh, contractures. When we look at the contracture formation in the joint capsule, we can see that for um, the adhesions in the synovial villi, um, that after in wounded tissue and hurt tissue, we will already see adhesions in two to three weeks and in healthy tissue after eight weeks, which is two months. But a good thing is we can make it um, uh, change and we can go to uh, a lengthening of those contractures. So if we put some elongation on cells, um, we will have an adaptation um, of the cells. And this is the overlap growing again. Those actines and myosines will grow again. And um, the good thing is if we hold them in that extended position, that no we will not only have an adaptation, but we will also have an increase of those serial sarcomeres. So that increase in the number of sarcomeres will make our muscle lengthen again. And why should we treat? That's always the question when we come in and we talk about contractures. Sometimes we forget why we should treat. And of course, we always say, um, yeah, we want a longer connective tissue um, because we want uh, an increase of range of motion. Yeah, and that's it. Why? It's very important to know where we want, uh, where we want to go with a treatment. First of all, I think in my opinion, it's uh, the most important thing is to restore the loss of function. This lady, for example, I followed uh, was a lady who had two contractures in her knees, wasn't able to walk anymore because of that contracture after total knee replacement. And um, so gain of range of motion will help her walk again. Of course, the positioning. And sometimes I have to discuss um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but we have to discuss about um, the positioning, uh, whether it is in a wheelchair um, or in bed, for example. Um, we can see that the seating position is very important and we need a good base. And the base is not only the pelvic, but it's also feet. So not having a good positioning of the feet uh, will make us our job as an orthotist um, very difficult. For hygienic purposes, we all know how difficult it is sometimes to open up as well for children as for adults. For example, just the legs to put diapers on to have the hygienic uh, normal uh, purposes of the day. Um, we also have the possibility to treat that. 
If and of are, course, for, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, could you just have a quick look and just admit a few people into the uh, webinar, yeah. please? Just on participants. Participants. Oh, and just yeah. go up top and just, could you just click on admit all? I think I just did that. Is that joining, joining? Oh, should I go back? Steve? Sorry, do you, do you mind just back? giving me hosting for just, if you can just do the same thing you did with Melissa before and then I'll allow you to share the screen and I'll sort that out. Sorry to interrupt. Not a problem. You asked me to, sh to host you again, that's what you asked to me. Yes, please. I think it's up to you. Yep, thank you. All right, you should be able to host now, um, share your screen, Flora. Steve, do you want me to go back? You can share your screen now, is that all right? Yep. Can you see my screen again? I can see your screen again. I think everyone else should be able to as well. Okay, welcome to everybody. Sorry, I didn't saw that coming in. Um, we're talking about how, why we should treat contractors. Um, and maybe I can just uh, pick in here that we need, of course, an increase of range of motion. Uh, but the important thing is to know why we should do that. And uh, one of the proposals was to restore the loss of function, having a better positioning as well for people just sitting in a wheelchair or in seating devices, which is very important for not sliding. Um, then we have the hygienic proposals. Of course, we want a better reorganization of fibers, which means that if we do an elongation or a rehab, it's important that the tissue that we have to work on is from a good texture and um, having that elongation on tissue, putting that little traction on, we will just have that better reorganization. We talked, oh, yeah. Um, we saw this picture before where we saw immobilization will lead to adhesions into the crosslinks. Well, we will have the opposite effect if we put some elongation on fibers. And of course, we want to prevent some wounds and ulcers. We all know if you've seen them once, those ulcers, um, it's not really beautiful to see, you will never forget them. Um, so we want to prevent that and make sure that we have an opening in joints so we can also have that hygienic, um, that we can wash and, and uh, uh, open up the joint. So before we go any further on uh, multi-motion um, itself, we will talk about just a case study. You just saw that lady um, who lost her uh, extension in both knees. Um, this woman was 63 years old. She had a total knee replacement at the left side in 2011. She never had some rehab and she started to have a really well flexion contracture, but she continued living with it. In 2015, she had another total knee replacement on the right side, and she also had that contracture afterwards. Um, but she had a lot of pain, which was not the thing in 2011, but this lot of pain made her uh, have another operation, a revision of the total knee, um, because there was a mechanical problem. But afterwards, she still had that flexion contracture in her knee. Only in 2018, um, they decided to do something and they did a passive mobilization under anesthesia. And after that, she was bedridden with a flexion contracture. But also while moving, they touched her popliteus nerve um, and there was deep ulcers on both heels afterwards because being uh, bedridden. We had equinus on both feet and there was a lot of atrophy. And it was only in June 2018 that um, the CPO was asked to do something. And this is when uh, we got uh, a call and see if we were interested to help this lady out uh, of those contractures. So how did we treat? Um, we treat following the LLPS protocol, which we will see uh, later. And it's very important to do measurements. Um, and we did that with fixed measuring points um, to have always the same uh, possibility of measuring. 
So how did it we how did we do that orthotic wise? If we are looking to the KFOs that we made, you can see that on the right side and on the left side, we made two different um, KFOs. On the right side, we put it two um, mild emotions on, so two dynamic ways of treating. And because not having really problems on the uh, left ankle, we put it a multi-static adjustable joint. Um, on the uh, ankle and a multi-motion on the other side, on the knee. We also added uh, a lot more physical therapy uh, in muscle strengthening, but also functional therapy and occupational therapy were really increased because the therapy was not really good um, while follow-up. So this is beautiful to see. It's a lot of input, but I will help you out. If you have a look at the two upper curves, those are the curves from the ankle, um, passive range of motion with the uh, knee flected in 90 degrees. And then we did the dorsal flexion. Uh, we measured the dorsal flexion uh, possibilities. Looking at the second one, we have here the knee extended, passive range of motion, dorsiflexion of the ankle. And then the two lower curves are the knees. And we can see here that we have the active range of motion um, at the knee. This is, oh, I have a color who changed. Um, it's not a problem. Uh, and the passive one is um, the orange, orange one. No, this just switched. Yeah. So the little stripes you can see here are the orange uh, stripes is the wearing time. And you can see that that lady was really dedicated and she started wearing the orthosis uh, almost on day three, up to 10 hours wearing time. And then we had just a breakdown. We had a really hot period here in, uh, in Belgium. We have them too. Um, and uh, she started to get some little wounds where the ulcers were before. And uh, we decided not to stop wearing the orthosis, but we just divided the wearing time up to three times a day, two hours. That's really uh, not much uh, instead of 10 consecutive hours. And what is very interesting to see is that while stopping that wearing time in here, you can see that the range of motion and the passive range of motion and uh, active range of motion is dropping down or stagnating. So that's very interesting, something we have to remind for the rest of our treatments that if we change the wearing time less up to less hours, um, we will have uh, a stagnation. And beautiful to see that the moment we just started to wear Again, the toes is longer consecutive hours. We have a beautiful increase of uh, measurements. And that was on the right side. Looking at the left side, we see almost the same thing. Um, dropping down while just stopping to wear 10 consecutive hours um, and then going up on the ankle. Again, the two upper curves are the ankle, the two lower curves are the knee. You can see here a stagnation even after um, that uh, wearing time uh, going up again. Uh, but we need to remind here that we have a contracture for more than seven years. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. As we look at the results, I just kept it really, I have more information afterwards if you want to, but I just went through the essential things uh, of that uh, case study. If we look at the right side in 89 days, we can see a gain of 19 degrees in the knee, uh, an active range of motion doing extension. If we look at the extension, the passive range of motion we measured, we have a gain of 17 degrees and we went up to minus 14 degrees. In the ankle, we have that dorsiflexion um, passive range of motion with the knee flected in 90 degrees, we gained 24 degrees. And looking at the ankle with extension knee uh, and with the dorsiflexion again, we gained also 24 degrees, but in the passive range of motion, the knee 90 degrees, we went up to 12 degrees of dorsiflexion. And if we do it with an extended knee, we went up to two degrees dorsal flexion, which is perfectly fine to walk. Looking at the left side in 89 days, remembering that we have a contracture that is settled since seven years, we can see that we have in the knee, again, an active range of motion of 13 degrees. 
and a gain of 15 degrees um, up to minus 20 degrees into the knee. Looking at the ankle, we can see that our dorsal flexion, active range of motion, knee flexed. We had a gain of 17 degrees and with the knee extended, uh, active range of motion of 25 degrees. We, she could both, uh, in both active and passive, go to 22 degrees, which is good on the ankle. So the conclusion we could say, I would love to follow her longer on, but the doctor decided not to let her in the rehab anymore. Um, but we saw after 89 days um, that we have a significant improvement of range of motions. The goals we wanted to achieve were walking and have some, um, because she wasn't able to do any transfers without help. And we achieved that. She was able to walk with a walking aid um, after those uh, 89 days. And also very important to see is that the execution of orders was much better. If in the beginning, if we asked her to do some extension, she didn't even know what to do. After having that uh, tension on her legs, she could feel again what extension was and also what flexion was again. You will see her walking. Um, don't blame me for her don't blame me for her having just one shoe um, she was just walking in uh, the uh, hall and i just asked if i could film her and this is how she get afterwards so in the beginning there was no walking or standing possible by herself and now she can do that of course she will need some uh, orthotics during the day but um, I think we can say now that she is able to stand and able to activate um, that range of motion. And of course, uh, we agree that she would need two shoes as well. Um, the action points really uh, necessary are um, more functional training um, to intensify that functional training and um, to have that automatization of movement. And we'd love to have some more view on those acrokinematic uh, obstructions if there are no calcification or so on. Let's talk about contractures and LLPS. The big word we also always say we we do it following the LLPS trend principles. But what is LLPS? If we look at LLPS, the words it say what it has to say. It's a theory concerning the application of a mild lengthening force over an extended period of time. What does that say? The most beautiful examples are children growing while being active moving we will not see it nor feel it but all those cells will just interact with um, and extend over the over the time it will take a, a long a few years but we will um, just add some cells and grow over and another beautiful example is um, a, a woman getting pregnant and um, we need nine months for the child to grow, but also the body to transform. We don't feel it, but it happens. We talk a lot of time about stretch. Um, if we uh, look in literature, we uh, talk a lot, of, uh, a lot of times about creep. Because what is creep? If we put um, uh, on a tissue a constant load, we will see that there will be a deformation, a progressive deformation. Um, and this is how you will find a lot of times also the word creep into uh, stretching. But it's very important, we talk about low load, to um, apply a really low force on that tissue because otherwise we can have some tearing uh, of tissue, audema, uh, inflammation and tissue necrosis, which is very logical if we are just thinking about uh, putting real large tension as the mom does to her daughter. I can hope it's maybe not her daughter, um, but this is um, really impressive to see and it's logic that we can have some um, yeah, hurting on uh, the tissue. So it's very important to have some prolonged gentle stress to have a, a remodeling done. So what is stretching? We all know those curves because every um, tissue, every uh, material has it, its own curve. While we have that elastic behavior, it's come back to its uh, own origin. And then we have that plastic behavior until we have a fracture. Now we have here the elastic plastic transition. 
uh, which is an important thing because we as PTs, if we do some manual therapy, uh, we put some force on, um, uh, on a muscle, but we cannot maintain that extension force. Um, and if we cannot maintain that, the connective tissue will return to its original length after several hours. In fact, if you remember patients that you have been mobilizing for 30 minutes, you let them go back, go back home or back to their room. And next time they come back, you will see that what you have gained the last day, um, you have to, it's gone. You have to redo what you had to do. And this is because um, we are stretching into that uh, elastic plastic uh, behavior and it always will come back to uh, its normal period. What we do doing some manual therapy on uh, a patient is we put some high load brief stretch um, uh, onto the tissues. And what we see here, and this is a very interesting uh, little schedule, is that we can see that we have that elongation and the force. And we can see for having that same elongation, um, we are uh, putting much more force um, to have it if we do it. Uh, fast. If we do it slow, we will see that we are further in elongation, but uh, we have a compliant uh, tissue. And if we are looking at that uh, curve fast stretch, we will see that we have we need a lot of force to get not even there where slow force and um, slow stretch will uh, achieve. So that's very interesting to see. And this is why we uh, insist on having that longer stretching, uh, which will lead to an increase in lengthening. Um, and you need to see it as a competition because um, the pathology tissue that has been touched by whatever reason uh, will always try to contract. Um, we also have those myofibroblasts getting in. So it's a competition in between the lengthening we want to apply and the pathology who really wants to conserve um, the shortening. Um, so it's very important then to keep in mind that the longer we will stretch, um, the better we will win uh, the competition. It's also very important that what we have gained in a range of motion that we put it as soon as possible in functional movements of core when of course when it's possible or in passive uh, movements uh, afterwards so why can't we stretch on this what is the biggest problem that we just saw on that other curve is that if we go and put too much tension on it is that we will activate uh, the myofibroblasts. The myofibroblasts, they want to really um, uh, save their integrity of the muscle and they will have, they have some contractile properties and they will contract to stabilize that muscle. And this is exactly what we don't need to have that lengthening. So in uh, trauma, the myofibroblasts will create a shortening, which means that if we put too much tension on a muscle, um, the myofibroblasts will have that retraction. And this is the reason why we need to stretch on another level. We need to stay that um, uh, behind that level of excitement of the myofibroblasts. So what we can say is that with LLPS, low load prolonged stretch, we will have uh, an integrity of tissue maintained. We will have no creations of myofibroblasts and it will be painless and efficient. So putting that elongation on, I can tell you that it's good, um, but it's good to know at what moment will it work? It's a question uh, we get a lot of times. Um, they say to us, how many times do we need to apply the orthosis on? So it's good to know that um, in connective tissue, we see a start, the start of the reorganization in muscles after four days. So stretching a muscle, putting some uh, elongation on that muscle, we will see the reorganiz reorganization coming up in four days. When we look to ligaments, it will only start to reorganize in six weeks. And looking to connective tissue to have really um, uh, loadable um, uh, tissue, we will talk about several months. So yes, it's a bit like the fairy tale, um, but 
eventually we will win, but we need some time and uh, some good follow-up. Uh, and of course, the sooner you will start your treatment, the better you will get the effects and the better you can prevent contractures as well. So the method for low, low, low load plunge stretch is um, the most important thing is third, our total end range time. Our end range time, um, which says that increase, the increase in passive range of motion will be proportional to the time the joint was held in that range. And that's exactly what we are going to do with the orthotics. It's safe and it's effective um, so that we don't, we don't have to carry about that. The intensity of the load, we need to do it slowly. We just saw it for not having those myofibroblasts uh, getting in. And uh, of course, we need manual therapy to have an effective combination. We will get a little bit back on that uh, later on, but it's good to know that we need, we cannot say here you go with your ptosis and we don't do anything beside. It's very important to have the PTs next to that. And of course, and I told it already, the gain you have with uh, a treatment, whether it is manual or orthotic wise, um, we should use that gain of range of motion um, because uh, if you don't lose it, you uh, don't use it, you lose it. So we talk about a dynamic treatment with multimotion. Um, what is that? So multimotion is, is, has a spring inside and uh, it will give a long the whole full range of motion, we will see the dynamic stretch coming up. <clears throat> Talking about the total end range time, that end range will be continued and guaranteed with a multi-motion. We will have the joint, um, the spring will just go up to that end range, like you see here, the uh, green curve. You can see here, this is our normal contractor. If we put the uh, multi-motion on, you can see that, uh, and we gain some degrees of um, extension, that the orange line will be our new end range of motion. It means that we will not only sustain the whole range of motion, but we will always have a new end range. And that's very important. It's also important to mention that it needs some follow-up because we need to know if we have some gain, yes or no. And the uh, next <clears throat> a good thing about dynamic treatment is that it allows activation of movement. You can see that child um, just, <laughs> um, I will do that again so you can see her. Yep, she is just, um, she is able to have that, um, a deduction and as she, as she is releasing, she is not well positioned on that bed because there's a little hole into uh, uh, the bed and she's sliding uh, from the bed. But you can see that it's possible to uh, uh, allow movement, which is very important for children or adults having some spasms um, that you know that positioning a person in a dynamic orthosis will also allow the movement and it will lower the pressure in the orthosis because we will not have one point with pressure on. It will be divided if there's too much pressure or too much tension, com tension coming up. You can just uh, move. And then we're gonna talk about our multi-motion system itself, which is a dynamic corrective system joint. And this is how it looks from the inside. We have inside the joint a flat coil spring, and that flat coil spring has a beautiful um, uh, character, character, and it is that while moving, and it's very important because we have to talk about a dynamic uh, treatment, while moving, we can see that we are not coming up and down like an elastic one. It says that if we are moving and just getting back um, from, flexion to extension, you can see that it is moving linear wise, which is also very important because we are not exciting some spasms on, uh, with this joint. You can do that with elastics. We always say with spastic, no elastic. That's totally true, but you can perfectly apply uh, a flat coil spring on spasms. And this is the reason why 
um, you have that uh, linear evolution during the movement, movements. We have different joints. Um, our products are adjustable in tension, of course, following the range of motion that we have. We have a small and a regular joint, which goes up to 3.4 Newton meters and 10 Newton meters. But this is totally, um, uh, this says nothing about the treatment itself. And we have so the ankle joint, which looks like this. It's positioned on a T-bar. Um, and this is how uh, an AFO can uh, look like. Talking about the other possibilities, we also can treat elbows, knees, and wrist joints with our uh, multi-motion integrated bars or not. Um, and then you can put them on ankles, knees, elbows, wrists, uh, whatever you want. Of course, and you saw it before, we have also our hip abduction joint, which we can apply for um, uh, increased uh, adductor tension or also um, the uh, hip uh, contractures as such, um, as well for adults as for children. And a lot of people say, yeah, but you talk dynamically because you don't have other products. Yes, we have. We also have the static treatment, which is our multi-static joint. And it's an adjustable static joint while turning um, the little screw in here, you can just adapt uh, the angle. So it's a good joint, uh, uh, for example, to join with a uh, biarticular uh, orthosis. So yes, we do and we can also treat static wise. How do we continue the dynamic treatment? Um, well, we should do it uh, multidisciplinary wise with a doctor, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, and a certified orthotist. Of course, this is ideal, but the most important thing we need is a compliant patient because if the patient don't wear the orthosis, yeah, then we don't have uh, any treatment at all. So how do we start? the uh, contracture treatment? Well, the first thing we need to do is to define the contracture. We need to know if there's no ankylosis uh, or atrodesis, of course, um, and if there are no bony uh, structures that will obstruct our range of motion. So we need some good arthrokinematics, and we need to check on that. After being sure that we can treat, um, uh, then we need to define the type of orthosis. And this is a very important one because um, we have the choice into monoarticular or biarticular orthosis. And this is very important to choose for the golden midway. Of course, it's biomechanically uh, better for patients to treat on biarticular. Uh, but we also know that sometimes it will just um, be too much and those patients will not uh, be able to support the orthosis. So in my opinion, it's very important to uh, make a good decision, um, sometimes make a decision of two monoarticular orthoses that the patient can wear. Um, and we all know if we put an orthosis on that is too much, too strong, not comfortable, where will the orthosis end? In the closet. So I think we all agree on the fact that it's better to have an orthosis that works for 80% and to achieve a goal that is acceptable uh, than having an orthosis that biomechanical wise is perfect, but that the patient cannot wear. So this is a good um, thinking process we should each time go through uh, with each patient. After that, it's important to define which joint types uh, you will use. Will we use two times multi-motion or will we just use a multi-static one on one uh, joint and just multi-motion on the other one? Um, or you can also say, yeah, but why not doing a multi-motion on one knee and totally static on uh, the ankle? That's a discussion really difficult to uh, do without a patient, um, but it's really important to consider that. After having uh, the, doing this, we have the orthosis, and then it's important that the patient supports the orthosis. So we need some comfort, and uh, we need to check that without any force on the orthosis, we will try to reach six to eight consecutive hours 
which at night is perfectly possible to um, uh, to achieve. And sometimes you will need a schedule um, for persons who are really um, hypersensitive. Um, and sometimes you will need uh, to do it two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and two hours in the evening, and then bit by bit just sliding those hours together to have one block of six hours. Once you've achieved that, you can say it's comfortable and we can start the treatment. Oh yeah, and it's important to say that the longer you wear your toes, we talked about that competition in between pathology and elongation, and um, the longer you wear it, the better it will be, the, the faster you will gain that competition, and um, the cells will have more time to transform and adapt itself. Once we start the treatment, um, it's very important that we measure the range of motion, active and passive, active if possible, of course, um, and to do that with unerasable points. Uh, it's a challenge, though, um, to ask the patients not to remove um, the points you marked, but it's important. Um, and then uh, you can measure always on the same uh, direction uh, with a goniometer. Um, and of course, if it's possible to um, let one person do the measurements, um, it's more effective than having each time another person um, because we all have other manipulations. In the box of uh, the joint, you will receive a chart, um, and in that chart, you can do, uh, you can fill in um, your uh, force of the joint, um, your um, range of motion, um, and so you can do the follow up and see um, whether you have some gain or not. And then we come to the physical uh, therapy, which is very important to um, have you beside the orthosis, um, we are assisting um, uh, what a PT is doing during the day because the orthosis will do uh, an angular moving, the roll um, will support that. So we need and we ask PTs to do the treatment of gliding, the translation of joints next to the orthosis um, so we can, can have some more opening to do uh, the range of motion of to achieve a better range of motion. So that's very important to, um, uh, to have a combination of um, those two, the hands and uh, the orthosis on uh, the other side. And then it's important that if we start to have some gain, that we need to add some uh, activities on and to use that range of motion because muscles will, uh, of course, um, be uh, used and will sustain that gain of range of motion. Then it's important to measure one, if possible, two times a week. Why? Uh, if we have no gain, so you measure, you measure again, we see that we have no gain of range of motion. Of course, the patient is wearing the orthosis uh, a lot of hours during the day, and we do not have any pain. That's the moment where we can just intensify the load. We say it's best to intensify the load just by one turnkey, uh, not to overload the tissue. That's a beautiful follow-up. Um, and it's really important for people having some tone and spasticity that we stay below the trigger of spasticity. If you see a spasm coming up, it's important to decrease the tension because we do not want uh, to intensify that tension. Once we are doing this, it's important that we just keep going on. Oh, and then we have a changing in my, uh, we'll just up, go a little bit, yep. Uh, we do uh, the, the keep going on. And then we have a lot of time to question, what do we do if we have achieved what our goal was? Um, it's important to continue a little bit more, depending whether it is a, neurog a neurological problem or an orthopedic problem. Uh, neurological wise, the patient will use it um, um, afterwards. Uh, orthopedic wise, just a little bit longer to avoid recurrence, but after a while, uh, functional activities will pick it over and uh, you will not need the orthosis anymore afterwards. 
in summary, we can say um, the most important thing for LLPS treatment is if we have no increase of range of motion, we wear the orthosis for minimum six to eight consecutive hours and we have no pain, only then you can turn up the force by one turning key. And we have a good result if we add dynamic treatment to manual therapy, um, to add some functional therapy, and of course, to um, do the normal activities of daily living if possible. A beautiful case study that is still uh, going on, and um, I didn't saw this man since Corona. Uh, I just saw him before we went in lockdown. Uh, we saw this man who was in a coma for two weeks, um, and once he woke up, he had a lot of hypertonia on the adductors um, and already uh, a contracture uh, in his um, abduction direction. The passive range of motion of those uh, hips were at the right side, nine degrees and at the left side 11 degrees. Tone and contracture. This is what we see a lot of times. This man was able to walk with a walker but not further than just a few steps because the feet keep, kept touching uh, each other. Uh, it was very dangerous and there was no active abduction possible not because of uh, paralysis but it was because of um, that contracture that was already installed in that two weeks of coma. And um, we started to treat with our DASH dynamic hip abduction system with multimotion. As you can see, we put a multimotion on the ankle, a multi-static on the knees, and then the hip abduction system on uh, the hips. Maybe it's important to clarify this. Because um, what we wanted to do with the system is um, working on the adductors, and we all know the adductors, we have a biarticular uh, one, um, that if we apply a little bit more flexion on, we will uh, be able to work better on the adductors. Once we've achieved a little more, more range of motion, we can apply some more extension on those knees to have that adductor um, more uh, treated. But we want to stay really low and acceptable for the patient and go, as we told, following the LLPS principle. What about the feet? The feet, we, um, he was very uh, glad that he can, could move again because um, he said, I'm fixed, but having those ankles, he was possible he was able to go into plantar flexion and once he just unloaded that he went back to dorsal flexion so it allowed a lot of movement and it was comfortable for him. We saw in two weeks um, already a big change. Uh, of course, he had some functional um, treatment uh, next to that. Uh, and we can see here that he was able to walk already with crutches and the feet um, well separated. This is how it looked like after two weeks. So he is not touching uh, anymore. And um, you can see that he is able to walk normally and he, he is able to use his ankles uh, well. After three weeks, um, we see an even bigger opening um, and uh, a wider active opening during gait and uh, also crutches instead of walking. So we can see an increase uh, bit by bit uh, and using this uh, functional uh, opening. After four weeks, you can see that he is able to do an active opening. He had to help himself and to, but he was able to do uh, a beautiful opening. Um, and you can see him walking here. Yep. And we added, important to know that on the system, uh, the hip abduction system, we are able to change the external rotation of the legs. So first of all, we worked on the adductors, then we extended a little bit more on the knees, and then we started to add a little bit of external rotation uh, on the legs to have, again, the better uh, positioning for the stretch on the adductors. After four weeks, um, and this is where I saw him the last time. Um, we saw uh, the 
result. Remember, we had nine degrees at the right side and 11 degrees at the left side. Now we can see passively wise that we have 23 degrees and 26 degrees. And he has now an active range of motion, which he hadn't had before, at the right side of 14 degrees and at the left side, 16 degrees. And he is able to walk with one crutch. Um, we need, and there will be an increase of functionality because of his wider range of motion. He, each time I asked him, he said he has no pain uh, of wearing the orthosis. A deductors on tension by the dynamic treatment, he said he had no tension at all on the orthosis. But very important to notice is that remember, and I will go back to um, this one, on the knees, we put it uh, a static joint on. And seeing this static joint on the knees, he said his reaction was that the hamstrings were increased in tension. This is what he could say. He said, I feel a tension on the back of my legs. And this is exactly the difference between treating static wise or dynamic wise, is that putting the dynamic joint on, he said no tension, but where the static joint was on, he felt a lot of tension coming up. Important. Um, and of course, we need the combination uh, with the therapeutic exercises. But what about tone? We just talked about him having a uh, tone and we talked a lot about the contractures as itself. And then I, uh, we see this man and this man, does he have a contracture? We really don't know because we only see a picture. In fact, um, this is uh, Michel having uh, ability to move. And seeing this, he has no restriction in extension. He just have, has big problems um, of uh, activation because of the hypertonia in his arm. What do we know about LLPS and hypertonia uh, and spasticity? We know that if we apply low intensity on tissue that is hypertoned or spastic, we see a relaxation coming up and this is because we um, are now stimulating we are also not stimulating myofibroblasts uh, getting in so we are just really doing it uh, really slow we saw him before um, he has no contractures in the extension direction, but is not able. Um, he had a lot of pain, and this is the reason where we were uh, called. Um, is uh, first of all, the doctor wanted something at night. Um, but what we saw during the test, putting multi motion on, is that he was able to do a beautiful flexion active wise and to have that extension assisted. So for this joint meant for him uh, a really uh, other uh, way of living because he was able to uh, use his arm otherwise than before. Good to see we talked about uh, monoarticular and biarticular joints. You can see that we did nothing, and this is only a testing orthosis, but we did nothing about the wrist. And the reason um, for this was that uh, he opened up very beautifully. And in the beginning, we put a tennis ball in his hand to avoid uh, his nails coming in into his arm to see what was going to happen. And we saw after 10 minutes, um, the, the ball coming out said, hey, Fleur, I cannot hold the ball anymore, just falling out of my hand. So we saw a relaxation coming up into the wrist as well. So we focused on the elbow during the day. And during the night, he get the multi-motion on his wrist to have that beautiful position of his wrist as well. So we use half a day, half a day, wrist, elbow, and we achieve by this, it's now three years, this man has those orthoses and he wears them every day and night. Um, and he is really um, happy because he can do some activity and the pain is really uh, less as well. 
So it's very important, and I will say it again, to do an early treatment. Because if we see, and we are looking back to the slides where we saw that in three days we see already loss of mass, in two weeks we see a shortening, after two weeks we see the muscle adapted, um, and we look to those joint capsule after two to three weeks in wounded tissue, it is already retracted. It's very important to put on the orthosis as early as possible because we will prevent contractures and it will be much easier to have that range of motion and, and to keep that range of motion. The total cost of the rehab will be less. A lot of times, and I'm sure you will see them as well, is we get patients come in, uh, whether it is as a CPO or as a PT, they come in because they have troubles. Um, and a lot of times you see patients with uh, equinus on the foot. Um, if we have bad luck, it's equinovirus uh, on the foot. And then they ask us to treat. But if we have um, treated that before um, that contracture coming up, the patient wouldn't have lost that much um, uh, range of motion and functionality. Um, and it's very difficult as a CPO as well to put an AFO on a person that has equinus on the foot um, because we are restricted in the possibilities. So sometimes it's better to say, hey, let street first contracture or tone uh, and see what happens into two and three months and let's then decide about a good orthosis during the day. We talked about uh, a lot of hours um, uh, treating. What do we do with uh, CVA patients uh, while we are putting them in bed? I just took a look, take, took a look yeah, on, uh, on the internet and I found a lot of beautiful positions of how to position a person with CVA into bed and look at all the feet that are not supported. And this is so important because a patient will be into bed for eight to 10 hours. And we know that after several hours, the competition starts over and the adaptation of shortening will just start. So it's very important to um, really put the orthosis early on and uh, that we have less equinus and then we will also have less risk for an increase of hypertonia. And having less equinus during the day, during the night, will mean that the patient will be able to really get faster out of bed and to put orthosis, day orthosis better on and better positioning during uh, the day. This is beautiful to see because this is a lady we saw in 2014. I didn't know her before, but we were called uh, to see if we could do anything. This lady was in 2014 after a knee operation, had a perfect angle, ankle, uh, and she had a full range of motion in her ankle. Um, and after six years now, she created a beautiful um, equinus in her foot. So that's sad to, to see um, because we all could help this lady before, um, but if they only come up at that time because it's a problem and the doctors don't know what to do anymore. Um, so it's very important if you see those patients, please treat them uh, as soon as possible. Also, this patient came in uh, for another type of orthosis, but the biggest problem was that we couldn't test because of that equinus already installed. A beautiful uh, case as well. Um, and it's the last case I will present to you. Um, this is a man, 65 years old. He had in 2014, he fell with a bike, was uh, a paraparitic person, and he was seated in a wheelchair afterwards. The training he did standing was um, with the exoskeletal, exoskeletal robot. Um, and he was able to do the transfers and walking into bars. That was what he could do. But his question was um, to, uh, he wanted to do some steps, some transfers by himself without a robot uh, getting on. And he heard about our swing phase lock system um, and he wanted to test. But having a, a patient with a lot of tone, which he had, um, and having some flexion on the knees, which you will see here. Uh, testing for an SPL is not possible at that moment. Um, so the CPO um, decided to 
maybe we'd start with a tone treatment, see what that can bring. But you can see we have tone and contracture that are really going together and seeing uh, what would happen. Very interesting to see that after um, doing this, we decided to put a K fold on with two multi motions, one on the ankle and one on the knee. And we started, first of all, to treat on uh, the knee. The beautiful thing about putting two multi motions on is that we can interact there where it is, there where it is absolutely needed. So we decided first to treat, because that's what we saw, uh, to do the knee. After two weeks, we saw already that the knee was extended at zero degrees with really small torque, 1.9 nanometers, And we decided to leave that tension on the knee and to start working on the ankle. And this is how we did it. He was a person who didn't wear the orthosis each day because he said, you know what, if I go out with some friends and I come in, I don't wanna put my orthosis on at two o'clock at night totally uh, respect that. But he put the orthosis on, seven hours, six hours, that was, uh, and we saw in 50 days that we gained um, in the uh, ankle um, up to zero degrees, again of 11 degrees, and up to minus two degrees at um, the left side. And we already had that knee active range of motion uh, zero degrees after two weeks of treatment. What we can say in this case is that LLPS had a positive effect on tension. So we had a relaxation coming in and thanks to that relaxation, we were able to treat that contracture that was uh, read already installed. He told us that he was so much easier to uh, move because he had um, that automatization and generalization of movements, um, the, the stimulation was better. I will show you again him walking uh, with those knees afflicted um, and having trouble. And look at the positioning as well of his body, the flected positioning. Um, and then we do the treatment with multi-motion and this is what we see um, afterwards. After almost two months, he is able to extend at the end of the swing phase and to use the system uh, where it's designed for. So did we achieve our goal and look at the upper body? Um, this man was able to walk with uh, a walker afterwards and uh, being at home um, with his walker and being autonom. So did we achieve our goals that we wanted to uh, uh, do? Yes, we did. In summary, you can say that the effect of dynamic treatment, um, the dynamic LLPS treatment, will create an inhibition of tone and will create relaxation. It will increase the compliance um, for further therapy because having uh, an orthosis, we didn't talk about that earlier, but um, having an orthosis that people are supporting, they will wear the orthosis more afterwards. And not only this one, but also other AFOs or other orthosis they will need afterwards. So for the compliance, it's very important as well. When we look to the connective tissue, we can see that there is remodeling. And if we have bad luck and it's not possible, at least we will have a status quo. Dynamic LLPS will also allow the movement and spasms if there are. And thanks to the dynamic system and the possibility of moving, we will also have a decrease of pressure. Um, and of course, um, we will support with the orthosis what PTs uh, and occupational therapists did during the day. So it will be a perfect combination uh, for a contractor treatment. Multi-motion to be dynamic, that's all I can say. I'd like to thank you all for um, assisting to this and we will see if we have some uh, questions. For those who are interested, those are uh, some of my uh, references. Um, and I will uh, see now if I can um, see the chat box I have. Let's see. Do I see anything?
chats. I cannot see anything on the chat, Steve. I cannot see the chat. It's at the Too bottom, Flora. Um, oh, maybe I have to leave my presentation. Wait, I will yes, stop possibly. sharing. Yeah, I think that will be it. Oh. Um, we have one question from Melissa Jones. Can you see that? Yeah, I'm reading this. Sure. Uh, It's more a thought I can read. Um, oh, no. No, I cannot see. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things going on. Can you read it? Because I. Uh, I, I can read it out to you if you like. Friendship is a moment of motion. Is there a limit on how large the degree of contracture is? Oh, yeah. I can, I can read it so everybody can read it. Maybe everybody is able to read it. Uh, there's Melissa Jones talking about uh, a client with a C5 spinal cord injury and a 90 degree elbow flexion contracture. Um, could uh, multimotion be appropriate? Uh, is there a limit on how large the degree of contracture is? It's also very important to look at, um, it's very difficult not having the patient in here, um, but I think the most important thing is to see if there is any range of motion possible. Still, whether it is in a little bit in flexion, uh, do we have any range of motion? And since when is this installed? Um, this is also a very important question. Uh, 90 degrees normally would be possible to treat. If we have, of course, a totally flected orthosis, technically wise, uh, as a CPO, we will have a lot of problems because we have to overgo uh, the 90 degrees angle. But 90 degrees uh, normally would be a good start to uh, start treating uh, for uh, um, uh, contracture. The thing I didn't mention was that patients with dystonia uh, will not be helped with a multimotion. I tried it four times and um, there's so much going on into the muscles that that won't uh, help. And we need to be uh, very uh, honest uh, with that. Um, but yes, Melissa, I think for uh, a person with 90 degrees elbow flexion, uh, having a little bit of manual range of motion, if you do that, um, of course, elbow for a, man, for a physical therapist is very difficult to do um, the manipulation on, but I'm sure you can uh, start with your toes. Also, um, the positioning of the shells will be a challenge. Um, to support the orthosis uh, as long as possible. Um, and this is something you can discuss with uh, a CPO. Are there other questions? Or remarks, because you, it's always uh, very interesting to have all those people in there and have some uh, remarks coming in as well, instead of questions. No. If anyone has so any questions, you? please pop them in that chat box. Um, there has there's been not just that one or two, but if there's any others, now's your time to speak up. <laughs> oh, there we go. There's one for you. Can you see that? Three new messages. That would be it. So what would, the, what would the process be to organize an assessment for these devices? Uh, not sure what, what, uh, what, what would the process be to organize an assessment for these devices? What, what, can you re-ask re, re the question? Redo the question? So I think if someone was, was hoping to trial or to see if one of these devices would be appropriate for them, one of these orthotics, what would be the steps that we would take? We, we talked about that before, Steve, because um, I know in Australia you have to um, prove that something can work. Um, it's not something that you will put on. If we do an SPL testing, we see immediately what it will do with contracture management. You can see um, for relaxation, if we talk about tone, you will see it 
immediately coming up. If you put a, a testing orthosis on uh, low loaded, you will see almost in a few minutes coming relaxation coming up. If we talk about a real contracture in style, it's really difficult to, um, yeah, to see it with a testing orthosis. But again, if we follow the schedule and we see, hey, is there any range of motion? There's no ankylosis, there's no atrodesis, um, uh, there's no calcification already in the joint, um, then we can be able to start up a contracture management. But you need to keep in mind that it's a long process, but you will get there if you do the good follow-up. You will just turn up the tension when you have no uh, uh, increase of range of motion. And that's our, those are the most important factors to start uh, a treatment. And just to add to that, Anna, um, basically, if you're a physio, we would recommend the orthotist that you would normally use to sort of get them to come and do an assessment. So if you think someone's got a contracture um, and you feel like a device like this would be beneficial, uh, we'd recommend get your orthotist, whoever is local, to come and do an assessment. Um, and then if they feel like, okay, you know what, this is actually going to work um, with everything that you've learned here today, then you get in contact with us and we will either supply the component or we will actually be able to fabricate the device. But we would recommend to get in touch with the local orthotist to come and do an assessment and go from there. So I take it you're a physio, Anna? Sorry, she if you can... Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, that would be our recommendation to um, get your local orthotist involved. As you saw Flora's uh, presentation, it's get the allied health. So you'll see a patient that comes in. Um, and if you feel a device like this would be beneficial for a nighttime splint, then get an orthotist on board. And then we'll just um, go from there pretty much. Um, and there's another question. Sorry, just to go. Sorry, Flora. Um, Kathy, no, 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 I saw that question as well. Yep. Um, there isn't a testing orthosis as such. Um, that testing orthosis is a, is a different um, device, but there isn't a testing uh, contraction management uh, device that we have. Um, it's pretty much a, a custom device. So we'll need to take a cast and make it for, for that patient. So there isn't a uh, testing orthosis for the contraction management as yet. Right. And just, um, Anna's actually asked the question there too, but um, I was thinking that as well. Have you had experience in Australia, Steve, with them being funded through NDIS? We have. Um, so our clinicians at Heads of Foot, we fit uh, quite a few of these. Yeah. Um, and there's a few orthotists around Australia who have had NDIS funding for these devices. Yes. So that is, that's good. Great. Thank you. We have a question from, um, oh, it disappeared. Um, what about a client who has minus 45 degrees contracture at the ankle? 45 degrees is a lot. And I think I didn't saw the patient. I don't have it in my hands. It's really difficult to, um, to judge. But 45 degrees, I'm a little bit... I'm not confident that it will work. I think it's too late because we have already 45 degrees is huge. Um, I think we already have a calcification depending on how long the patient has that uh, um, yeah, contracture um, depending on the tension we have on, on tissue. Difficult to just uh, answer that um, by video, but it's, um, I think it's a lot also technique wise here we go again we have that elbow over um over flected and talking about an equine i i believe i suppose it's an equinus from 45 degrees otherwise we will have a, a real difficult uh uh foot but it's um i have my but it's, it's yeah I wouldn't say it's worth trying, but it's important to redo again. Do we have any range of motion? Is there any possibility of moving? Um, and if we don't have that, then it will be very difficult. I'm not too optimistic as well. <laughs> we need to stay realistic. Um, but that's the reason why those patients who come in with a, an equinus of 45 degrees, I'm sure if we saw them two years ago there was already going something going on and we could have helped them at that stage to avoid the lady you saw with the foot totally in equinus same story 2014 nothing was going on and bit by bit and in 2020 she came in with an equinus of almost i think we we also had that 45 degrees which is 
really difficult to um, uh, because having the 45 degrees in equinus we also have some bony structures changed um, not sure citrino messages coming in there's a question oh, so you will um, yeah you go, Melissa. no you go you go no i think you're going to answer it um you're the person to answer it but how much approximately do they cost is one question um, yeah, just to if I'll, I'll get that, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, if you guys don't have access to an orthotist locally, you can give us a call head to foot orthotics, um, and we can do sort of a consultation over FaceTime if need be, um, and sort of take you through that process as well. Uh, cost wise, it'll so in order for us to make the device, it'll be it'll range around the 1500 to two, um, to you guys. And then you got your NDIS on sort of on top of that, your clinical time, um, which you will have to add on to that. But for that device, because it's custom made, um, it'll, it'll be around that price. Uh, but if you were to, if I'm able to get people's emails, I can give you, um, I guess a bit better of a breakdown as to what's involved with that. And uh, we can go from there. You can privately, if anyone wants to give Steve your details, you can private in the chat box, you can select to only send a message to Steve Joseph um, and you can send your contact details directly to him there. I think that's all of the questions on there that I can see, Flora. I can see it too, yeah. Thank you so much, that was fantastic and so good to have that level of detail um, and really, really enjoyed all the case studies that you presented too, really made it real life for all of us um, and thank you for answering all of the questions that people had too. It was really, really my pleasure. It was good to see some familiar faces and I, I probably won't come to Australia this year so it was really good to see. <laughs> oh, you spent two weeks in the whole quarantine hotel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, maybe i will just stay in belgium <laughs> yeah. well we'll hope to see you soon or maybe in 2021 we'll see you over here yeah i hope we can manage that thank you very much thank yeah. you all thank you, thank you all for attending thank you melissa from advanced thank rehab you. center for helping organizing this and yeah hope you guys got a bit of insight into um your contracture management and uh, any questions please feel free to contact us and um yeah have a great evening. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Enjoy your Just day. Just the beginning of the day in here. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, Melissa, and thank you so much. That's all right. It's nice to see you again virtually. Was it, I can't, was it June, la, June that you were here? Uh, no, it was uh, October of end of September. <laughs> I, I can't remember. I, I, something like that. Yeah. So it's like the June feeling in here. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> I heard it's getting colder in there. So we have, uh, maybe it's the same thing in Great Britain. You maybe you know by your family, but yeah. in here it's hot. We don't have any rain. It's too hot for the time of the year. So we're getting a little Australia feeling. <laughs> yeah, no, I know my family have all said it's glorious over there at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It won't so. last too long. I'm sure the rain will come before too long. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure, but we hope for some rain. We almost do some rain dancing because nature is really yeah. suffering. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, well, we managed that. Oh, good. good. Right. Everything is going fine in, the, in your... Yeah, yeah, we moved. We actually were in a different place now from when you came over. So we've just around the corner, um, but we've moved to a, a big, super fancy new clinic. Um, which oh, is really? really exciting. So yeah, we're, we've got two big gyms and an upper limb technology suite. So we've got lots oh, of the wow. um, the devices. Almost jealous. Ooh. I know. Exciting to see that. We still, oh we wow. Moved in on the thirtieth of March. So pretty much just in the peak of um of the pandemic. But we still get still get excited every day coming to work now with all the new <laughs> the new. It was stuff. already. You were good in style as as already, but now it's even better. Oh, it's so it's such an upgrade on the last place. We look back now, we're like, how did we all fit in there? What were we doing? Oh, really? Oh, really? oh yeah. You get really fast used to new uh, proportions. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, we've certainly raised our um, expectations now, so we'll be. <laughs> 
but I did you have less people coming in or did you continue the physical therapy or yeah it was definitely quieter in the clinic it's picked up again now um but lots of people wanted to transfer to just be seen at home instead so the community team stayed quite busy seeing people in their homes lots of nursing homes and group homes and things went into lockdown um but we just the team really embraced telehealth actually and all the clients so people have done you know the clients have all done really well at picking that up and just keeping active and keeping moving um that's because you're really stimulating behind and that's so important to have a good team yeah and just embracing technology because it's easy i think it can just feel too hard sometimes can't it with tech but um yeah no it's it's been significantly better than we'd anticipated <laughs> okay oh that's good um, that's really but fingers good. crossed we're coming out the other side of it now hopefully um how about down in melbourne steve is it similar similar down in melbourne similar very very much so um and we're now we're just we're slowly seeing uh, more patients come in now with elective surgery being available again or opened up so uh, we're slowly seeing an increase of our patients um, not to quite the extent that it was, but it's it's heading in a positive direction, which is which is great. Yeah, definitely. Well, fingers crossed, it all continues that way. Yes. Yeah. Right, we good. also are um, good. It's good to hear that everything it's is. Lovely to see you, and hopefully we'll see you see you at something else again virtually soon. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> maybe on SPL. Woo! -hoo. <laughs> so, beginning, I have a I have a better presentation now and a, a beautiful cases as well. So yeah. it would be very interesting to do that. Good. Excellent. Speak to you Super. soon. Thanks. Hey, Melissa, love a, to see just, you guys. Just a quick question. Um, would you happen to have the emails of the people that did attend? I'm sure we have. I will, um, yes, I will have a look at that and send that through to you in the morning. We, we actually just transferred, um, I think yours was the, oh no, not quite the first one, um, of using a new booking system. Oh, yep. all the lights have just gone out in the building. <laughs> I'm obviously here <laughs> too late. <laughs> um, oh, there's someone else too, that's fine. Um, yes, Mel, yeah. quick question. Can we send, have we got the um, email addresses of everyone from the yeah. Archer? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. 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 Great. I'll send it through to you in the morning. Because I, <laughs> I was just thinking of doing, Thank just, you. A, um, just sending through to everyone even just, um, I guess, a feedback survey just to see what maybe we could have improved on. And uh, yeah, we're just getting their thoughts on. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, it'll be great if I could get that list. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I'll put that on my to-do list now. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Have a nice evening for you guys. Thanks. And hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care, Bye -bye. guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.